Okay, so Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Rahim. Um, let's start, okay? Sure. <laughs> Inshallah, may Allah help us make this, you know, a very important conversation um, that will be meaningful for many years to come, hopefully long after both of us are gone, inshallah. Um, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, thank you everyone um, for joining us um, for this very, very special conversation with my friend Cameron Lee. Um, I um, had asked Cameron if he would mind having a very um, deep and um, honest and frank and, and brave conversation about life and death, um, because um, very sadly, um, Cameron recently received news um, that he is, um, his liver is failing. He's been struggling with fighting cancer for, for many years since 2016. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's not often that we have an opportunity to to know, um, you know, like that our the end of our, our life is before us and have a conversation about it. Um, and Cameron has always been someone who I've been so impressed, um, has been very honest and frank and, and you know, deeply inspiring, articulate, um, super smart, um, and willing to have a conversation at this difficult time. Um, first, for anyone who is not aware, um, well, I'm, my name is Grace Song. I'm the executive director of the Suli Institute. Um, we are a 501c3 um, nonprofit education institute. We're focused on elevating um, ethics, critical thinking, and dignity through education, and we focus on um, right now, uh, really understanding our tradition, um, digging deep into the Quran, the message of the Quran, trying to um, you know, identify the moral principles of our faith and learning how to apply them in our modern day. Um, and we, we often tackle very controversial issues, deep issues, human issues, things that we feel are really important and relevant for our world. Um, what's really special about the conversation, um, Cameron and I are both converts um, to Islam. And so I feel a real um, connection because the convert experience is one that's very unique and very special, requires um, a lot of you know, diligent research, uh, certainly in our world. Um, you know, it's not really easy to be Muslim in this day and age. Um, and for you to make the decision to um, you know, change everything about your life um, and adopt a new religion, especially the one that's probably the most hated on the face of the planet is not something very easy to do particularly given um, you know, family, friends, reactions, and you know, even just the world at large. Um, so I'm hoping that with this conversation, you know, we can have a chance um, to talk about conversion, talk about Islam, talk about life and death, um, and also you know, um, leave something really important behind, um, hopefully long after both of us are gone, that um, is thought provoking and helps people connect with what's really important. And, and hopefully have better, hopefully have a better understanding of Islam um, through this. So Cameron, thank you so much again for joining and for agreeing to do this. And, My pleasure. Uh, it's, um, you know, I, I wanted to begin because in preparation for our conversation, I went back and I, I dug up our, our first email um, communications. And I thought that, um, you know, this was four years ago, our first email came, um, January 14th, 2018. So two years before COVID, which is a completely different world, literally. Um, but it, you know, in some ways it feels like it was just a blink of an eye ago. It doesn't seem like it's been four years. Um, but at the same time, it's like our world has drastically changed and so much has happened, I think, since, since we first made that communication. But I thought that it would be really valuable um, just to get everybody on the same page. Um, if I, you know, and you gave me my, your permission for me to read the very first email that you wrote to Professor Abel Fuddle. Um, for those who don't know the Suli Institute or um, Dr. Abel Fuddle, Dr. Abel Fuddle is um, one of the um, uh, world renowned um, experts on uh, Islam, Islamic law, Sharia. Um, he's the founder of the Suli Institute. He's also my husband and um, is very instrumental in my own development as a Muslim. Um, I've been a convert now for 28 years. I just had my 28 year anniversary this past week. Um, and I, I know, Cameron, how many years have you, how long have you been a Muslim? Just, I know that you, I mean, this I is a complicated for question. Four years. For four years. Yeah. Okay, that's right. All right. So I, yeah, this will come in, in as I read your, your email. Um, and so 
um, Dr. Buffettel is is oftentimes someone who people um, turn to for um, you know advice. Oftentimes, is people might turn to like a rabbi if they're Jewish, or to you know a pastor if they're Christian. Um, someone who um, has very deep knowledge of the tradition and can offer spiritual guidance as well as you know knowledge. But so let me start by reading this email that you wrote back um, to uh, to Dr. Buffettel, um, January twelfth, two thousand eighteen. So. Um, this gets us on the same page. Dear Professor Bofuddle, peace be upon you and your family. I'm a huge fan of your work. Your books and writings were my introduction to Islam and had a huge influence on my decision to become Muslim. I have a few questions regarding terminal illness, and I hope that you can lend your expertise to and help me understand my faith better. In March of 2016, I was diagnosed with stage three colon cancer. I had the surgery and I went through chemotherapy. I was declared to be in remission. Unfortunately, there has been a recurrence and it has spread to my liver. The prospects for surviving this are low. My oncologist said the five-year survival rate is 25%, but is not terminal yet. Ultimately, it is in the hands of his graciousness. Thus, I will work with my oncologist to take advantage of everything modern medicine has to offer, but I also recognize that it may simply be my time. My questions are, one, I know that euthanasia is, as far as I can tell, universally prohibited. However, what kind of guidance is there regarding cessation of treatment? Modern medicine accomplishes much compared to the past, but one of the area of mixed blessings is its ability to keep people alive far longer than physicians in the past have been able to. I am willing to quote unquote, fight the good fight in trying to treat cancer, even if it becomes terminal, but at one point, would I be allowed to let nature take its course? I'm absolutely terrified of the Hadith in which God, may he be exalted, said of a man who had brought about his own death, quote, my servant has hastened his own death. I have forbidden paradise to him. I do not want our beloved to deny me paradise because I stopped treatment, even when treatment became futile. The second question was regarding palliative care. What kind of guidance can you offer regarding usage of opiates to manage the intense pain that comes near the end of life when fighting cancer? Opiates are currently the most powerful method doctors have for attenuating pain, but they are narcotics that affect mood, judgment, and are highly addictive. I know under normal circumstances, Muslims are not allowed to take intoxicants, but dealing with end of life physical pain is not a normal circumstance. One can even consume pork and alcohol if their life depends on it, but that is life preserving. Can I use opiates to enhance the quality of my life in my last days? And then the third question is, I have not told my parents who are both living and healthy, thank God, of the recurrence of my condition. They helped me through the first round. I have no idea how I'm supposed to tell them that there is a significant chance that I will not be here in five years. In fact, the possibility of returning to God bothers me much less than the effect I know my passing will have on my parents, especially my mother. I would appreciate any spiritual guidance in this regard, and if it is relevant, they are not Muslim. I know these are weighty questions, so if you can point me of a good direction or of a good analysis that can be trusted, I would greatly appreciate that. So this was obviously, I mean, for us, when we received this message, I remember it was really um, painful and, you know, and, and devastating. Um, I mean, we obviously didn't know you, um, but, you know, this is um, obviously very, very weighty, difficult questions. Um, and let me then also begin by sharing with you the response that Dr. Abelfuddle sent you, um, which I thought in reading it again was extremely beautiful um, and powerful. So, dear Cameron, Salaamu Alaikum, I pray that this message finds you in the best of spirits and that Allah enriches your life with all that is beautiful and good and that Allah heals you and gives you strength and good health. Your message has had a considerable impact on me. I was very happy to hear that my writings have played some role in bringing you to Islam, but at the same time, so sorry to learn of the return and the spread of the cancer. You raised a number of questions and I will do my best to address them. But before I do that, it is incumbent um, that you remind yourself that life, death, health, and healing are from God and God alone. Medicine, doctors, and all other methods are but instruments of causation in a temporal world of cause and effect, but ultimately it is God's will that prevails. I'm aware that you do not fear death, but you must also not surrender to the idea of death and always believe that whatever God wants shall be done. I can't tell you how many people I have known in my life who were given a variety of life expectations, 
only to find that God's will is often at odds with the predictions of medicine. Embrace life as a gift from the Almighty and um, as the prophet, peace and blessings be upon him said, live as if you will live forever and worship as if you will die tomorrow. In these situations, it is critical to celebrate every moment of life as a gift from God and make it as meaningful as possible and let God present you with whatever is best because you and I do not know and God knows best. You asked about the obligation to seek treatment and this does raise a rather difficult question. When the results of treatment are speculative or improbable and have serious side effects that are injurious or painful, the answer is often not clear cut. When there is a reasonable level of certainty as to the cause and effect of medicine and cure, and the side effects or unintended consequences of medicine are limited, we do have an obligation to do whatever is necessary to preserve ourselves, our lives, and well being. However, the matter gets more complicated in cases such as a cure for cancer, when chances of a cure are less probable and the side effects are sometimes as lethal um, as the cure. The best opinion that I have encountered in this, these situations is that it really depends on your intentionality. If you refuse treatment, not because you want to perish, but because objectively the results of treatment are speculative and the side effects unpredictable. And at the same time, you do everything within your power to preserve your life, such as healthy eating and natural remedies and so forth, then this is not akin to casting yourself unto ruin or seeking self-destruction. As you put it, it is important that we fight the good fight. But this does not mean pursuing every venue offered by modern medicine, even if the unintended consequences could be damaging, painful, or degrading. I must tell you that from other situations I have encountered, I have become an advocate of traditional or what one might call natural remedies. It might be really worth the effort to completely change your diet and seek non-Western methods of treatment, given giving your own immune system an opportunity to heal and resist. In the opinion of scholars that I respect, in situations of a spreading cancer such as this one, this is also a part of performing your due diligence and discharging your obligation of best efforts towards the preservation of your own life. I emphasize again that when all is said and done, you must trust God's will and what God wants for you. If God wants to keep you in this world, then perhaps God, God will help your immunity system fight this disease and prolong your life. If not, then God knows best. Um, the second question has to do with palliative medicine, and I can say that I have not encountered much disagreement about this. If necessary to cope with the pain and to be able to function, then you do have the license to take narcotics. Nar narcotics are not advisable in non-terminal diseases or in non-critical diseases where a person should reasonably be expected to handle the pain rather than become an addict. If you find that you are no longer able to bear the pain, then in my view, and God knows best, you have a license to use narcotics to be able to cope. I am not a fan of narcotics because I'm well aware of their side effects and that at times they even rob patients of the very will to survive or resist death. But I am also well aware that stomach and liver cancer could be extremely painful and narcotics could be simply um, be, could become a simple matter of necessity. I pray for strength to your parents and your family. In my humble opinion, you have no choice but to tell them about the recurrence of your illness, especially if the illness becomes terminal. They must be able to prepare for the consequences and to cherish the moments, the moments that they have with you. This of course is very personal and varies from one individual to another. Some patients say that the pain that they see on the faces of their loved ones is counterproductive and harms them instead of helps them. <coughs> Excuse me, but all things considered, put yourself in the position of your parents. <coughs> excuse me, and ask yourself, <clears throat> what would you deem to be your just rights? And how do you wish to be treated? <coughs> As the prophet peace and blessings be upon him taught. If you want to know what is right by others, put yourself in their shoes and ask how you would want to be treated. This has been a difficult message to write. In conclusion, what I want to tell you is make every breath, every second count. A big part of your possible cure is happiness and not misery. So do everything that would make you feel that your life is meaningful, full and beautiful. Deal with every minute with the full realization that you will stand before God and testify as to how you spent every minute now that you have received a stark reminder of our mortality. So many of us live in a state of oblivion until death is right upon us. You have been blessed that God loves you enough to remind you of your mortality in a stark and powerful fashion and to give you the opportunity 
to make every instant until you leave this world be full of beauty and meaning. I often tell my family that I have noticed that those Allah loves seem to leave this world younger rather than older. And perhaps I can be selfish and pray that Allah loves you a little less so that you can stay with us longer. I pray for a very long time. Your brother in Islam, Sheikh Ali. So um, I don't know if you remember that message. You, I think you had written in response that you read it a bunch of times. But, yes. Uh, maybe you could start by just telling us, um, you know, if we go back in time a little bit, you know, maybe how, where you were at that time, how you felt when you received that message, you know, how things have been going and, um, you know, anything that you'd like to share. Sure. So basically I've, you know, one of, one of the things that email that neither email kind of covers is the fact that um, while I say that, <clears throat> that, uh, Professor Alfalo's work was a road to Islam. I don't quite say why or how um, in, in that journey. And, you know, briefly, basically the, the 30 second version is that, you know, after 9-11, I became interested in Islam because I wanted to know more about it and know more about what, what it is that was causing people to want to attack us. And so, um, I picked up the LA Times and just around the same time, they had done an article about Professor Al-Fadl and um, his works and how they would gotten banned in Saudi Arabia, I believe, and a few other places. So I figured any, anybody whose work gets banned by Saudi Arabia is probably worth reading. So <laughs> um, I know that the Professor, the professor Al-Fadl also um, would answer questions kindly, you know, on his website and stuff. So I, I wanted to try to see if I could take advantage of that and see if I could, you know, because I know he's super busy, but um, it was a chance to see if I could, you know, slip in a question and see if he would actually respond. And I think I, I visited you guys um, maybe that same year, maybe technically later that same year, yeah, later almost a year, year later though. Um, yeah. And I even told Professor Alfadl, um, this was at your, you know, your LA home. Um, you know, they, uh, I, told, I told him that I was kind of starstruck because, you know, I got to actually, I was actually meeting Professor Alfadl <laughs> and, you know, I thought that was neat. Um, so in terms of actually, you know, reading it, you know, when I saw the inbox um, that I had an email from him, I was, you know, super excited. Um, and a little nervous too, um, if I'm being honest, um, <laughs> because I didn't know what he was going to say. Um, I mean, he's not—he's not a cruel or vindictive man, but um, <laughs> but he also calls it like it is, and um, and it's very can be very very frank. That's a good thing. Um, so you know, in terms of where I was getting that message, you know, I, I was I was excited to to be getting the message. And um, uh, and you know, hopefully, was you know, would be able to ask ask more questions in the future. Yeah. Um, I think you also followed up, Grace, with a you know, with some emails too. So I corresponded with you somewhat. Yeah, I so, did. So this was interesting because this happened. Um, you know, we we had launched the Suli Institute in December of two thousand seventeen. And I think so we heard from you the next month by that time I think we had done two halakas and I was, you know, um, in my, I, I was really excited to talk about converts. Uh, the, I remember after the first very first halakha we had the professor had invited me to say something about conversion and the plan when we launched a suli was that I, I didn't have any plan to speak or say anything or play a role other it was pretty much like oh okay here's the sheikh and you know. Sure. welcome. Um, so I had the opportunity to say, tell a little bit about my story um, and get all passionate about how I felt converts are the future of Islam. And I remember after having put on our website an invitation to converts to share their story, you wrote. And so when I saw your message, of course, I jumped on the opportunity to ask you, you know, to talk about your story and, and share. And sure. this was so powerful and, um, Obviously, I, I have the email where you were talking about how I think you asked your father to buy 
the book that you knew was banned in Saudi Arabia for you, speaking in God's name. Yeah. And um, well, let's uh, maybe we can start with with your convert story. Can you share? Sure. The um, the convert story, kind of like I touched on, was was that you know I wanted at the time I was in high school, and it was around the time that I first got introduced to Islam uh, in school. I went to a parochial school. And it was, it was more along the lines of almost like, I would liken it to going to a museum and saying, okay, now here's Islam, now here's Buddhism, now here's Hinduism. And you didn't really spend any real time on it because you just didn't have the time. Plus it wasn't an Islamic school, it was a Christian school. So- and you were in California, um, you grew up in California, right? In Southern that's, California. That's correct. Um, and so we, um, around again 9-11 you know like I said uh, my next engagement was when I wanted to learn more about Islam because of the 9-11 hijack situation and I wanted to learn more about it and um, you know when, when I you know asked my father to buy it off of Amazon for me um, you know usually they're pretty good at, they were pretty good my parents that is um, are pretty good about buying me stuff educational stuff um off amazon i had those kinds of parents that if you could cast it as it's educational they would usually buy it for you uh, <laughs> <laughs> um so if you could if you could do that you could get away with it so that's how i got away with it was that i i said that this guy's excuse me this guy's stuff was um educational therefore um, please buy it for me. It wasn't like super expensive, but I think on on Amazon at the time it was like sixteen dollars or something like that. So it wasn't cost prohibitive. Um, but you know the 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 that that was kind of my next stage of understanding Islam in terms of understanding the kind of the scholarly background. Um, the next kind of big step, and over the years I would you know stay. I would, you know, do Google searches for the professor and try to keep keep up to date with his his articles and what have you. And I would, um, I don't know if I would say that I was a bad Muslim per se, but what happened was I would I would continue to um, drink alcohol and eat pork and justify it to myself by saying I'm not a Muslim. I haven't taken the shahada. Um, Although you believed, but you believed Islam was the true message, right? Pretty much. Yeah. But again, I thought I, I thought I had an out by saying that you know again I wasn't I wasn't breaking any rules since I was I hadn't taken the shahada yet. Right. So I remember you told me that. Um, whether or not that gets that you actually God would actually buy that probably not. Um, <laughs> 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 So but, how long did yeah. you how long were you in that state of like uh, I know Islam is right but yeah I kind of like what I'm doing I don't really want to convert I want to give Ooh, it up that would be from high school senior year which would probably be about eighteen to when I got the second diagnosis or recurrent cancer which would be when I was thirty three thirty four. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. So, you know, a decent amount of time, 16 years or something. So um, was, you wrote me that you, you told me that you felt like God was telling you, okay, time to get serious. Yeah. I, I thought that, I thought that, you know, he was, he was sort of putting me in a corner, so to speak and saying, okay, it's, I've, I've given you enough time now. It's time for you to make a decision. Um, what is your decision? And I, I, you know, I, I thought to myself, well, you know, what, what do I prefer, the blessings of the afterlife or whiskey? And, <laughs> and, and you know, it's not a hard decision when you put it in those right. terms. Right. Um, so, um, you know, I, 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 it was basically after I had gotten that diagnosis that I had um but I had uh went ahead and converted in my heart 
as well as converted in person to a Muslim friend of mine. Now he he took my conversion, but he he was not he he was not as devout as some Muslims are. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a while again before I took the actual shahada in Arabic. Um, that that happened only actually relatively recently, but I knew that I had taken it taken it in my heart, which was the most important thing. Absolutely. And and so um during that as well as during all the practices that you're supposed to do when when you convert like praying five times a day and um what else you know fasting during ramadan and th things of that nature so you know pra practice practicing as a, as a muslim is um different than studying it from the outside i, I think you would agree and um <clears throat> So, uh, you know, yes, no more, no more whiskey, no more bacon, <laughs> praying five, praying five times a day, um, you know, fast during Ramadan, give zakat, et cetera, et cetera. And none, none of those things are a big deal. I mean, it's, it's not, but, um, they're just things you have you 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 do as part of part of the faith and part of the tradition. <clears throat> what was it? <clears throat> so take your time. <clears throat> excuse me. <It's> okay. <clears throat> so that's that's part of you know my conversion story. Um, I don't know if you want me to go into more detail or talk yeah, about it. Yeah, I'm curious to know. I mean, so you you went to a Catholic, Catholic or Lutheran school. That's right? correct. And you said that I think remember from your emails you were saying that um, you were really grateful that your your parents were really um, and, and even the school was um, open to you know other other faiths except Catholicism, right? Catholicism was pretty, evil. pretty much yes. They, <laughs> they every every year they would take time out to bag on Catholicism. Okay. Um, but that's that was that that was you know, the ongoing, you know, Lutheran Catholic rivalry that we see right. in the world. Right. Yeah. So, but what, what was it for you, um, you know, that really made you feel like, okay, you know, Islam is, is the true message. And especially, oh. I mean, after 9-11, you know, I mean, I guess there was a window of time where people were actually genuinely curious about Islam before the rise of Islamophobia. But I'm just wondering, like, what was it in that really um, made you recognize that, okay, this is the path for me. This is, this is the truth, as I understand it. That's, that's, the, that's a good question, um, you know, and which is why you're asking it. Um, <laughs> in terms of why I accepted it as opposed to other religions, um, I would say it's, it's consistency. There's a, a, I wouldn't say it was any one thing. I would say that there's a variety of little things that, that, that contributed to it. And among those things were things like um, consistency. Um, Islam is very, very consistent um, within itself, which I, I think is a good thing. Um, fairness, a sense of justice, a sense of mercy, um was there a cetera, moment cetera. Like, so an aha moment for you that you were like okay that's it or did you have like a divine inspiration or sign or you know like was there something that there, there was no at the time there was no inspiration or there was no um there was no inspiration there was like a dream or something like that i i, I have had um, religiously based dreams and we can talk about those in a little bit but um at the time in terms of you know the years that passed between you know 9 11 and, and being diagnosed with a recurrent cancer um i couldn't i couldn't point to one, any one thing that that would say aha that's that is what what caused right. me to, to believe so um like I said, consistency more than anything. So like, again, I came from a Christian background. One of the things that's always bothered me about Christianity, and it, the Bible explicitly says this, though many radicals will not 
talk about this because they don't want to um, is that um, they like to say that uh, there is a line in the Bible that says you commit a sin whether or not you know you commit a sin or not mm-hmm. and that to me seems really unfair <laughs> uh, um, you know if if it's one thing to to knowingly mess up and knowingly commit sins and then knowingly that then knowing that you have to repent um, but I'm gonna shift positions here a little bit hold on um but you know they the notion that you can commit a sin without knowing that you've committed a sin is kind of unfair now i will i will say this about uh, you know my time in the wilderness as i call it you know versus christianity versus islam um you know the the thing that has always kind of weighed heavily on me um, along all three kind of, I don't know, religions, if you call it a religion, is the, you know, the problem of hell, um, what philosophers have called the problem of hell, which is how does a just God create a place like hell to punish people? I mean, because the, you look at, you pick up a crayon and you read about the very colorful and violent descriptions of hell and it, it's, it's kind of depressing <laughs> in, in a way. So I had that problem before Christianity, during Christianity, I had it after Christianity, I, ha- I still have it, um, you know, and I've, I've, I've tried to um, resolve it as best I can. Um, but, you know, I still, so I, I guess the bottom line is I still struggle with my faith is, is the bottom line, but in terms of any one thing that led to my um, conversion or deciding that Islam was the truth, um, again, it's sporadic. It's you know, it's kind of a, a, a splatter painting of different things that that um, came up over the came up over time. How did um, how did your parents react when you told them that you would? that one that you're Muslim and and I guess how are they um you know like when you more were, more or less apath- with apathy <laughs> they, they no seriously they they my my father reacted like oh okay well let us know if you have like an imam and and you know, <laughs> okay and and uh stuff like stuff like that my mother was more like why are you doing that <laughs> and and uh, was was fair i mean she she you know got god bless her she she you know she wasn't she wasn't judgmental about it she just was kind of like why, why are you doing that and um i think that for the most part they were supportive though that's great come to that it's great yeah, and um you're you're an only child right I have an older brother. I know, correction, I have a younger brother. A younger brother. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, I didn't know that. How, how, um, how, did, he, how did he react? Um, you know, to be honest, I haven't really told him. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's coming in on Tuesday, so he may, he, Tuesday? Monday, Monday. He's coming in tomorrow. Yeah, he's coming in tomorrow, so um, he, he may find out then. Um, Nothing, nothing against him, of course. I, you know, he and I have a decent relationship, but um, for for the most part, um, yeah, he he and he and I were not that close. Um, so the notion that you know I would share that with him just didn't really pop into my head at, at the time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, how um, how is your family doing now that you they with the latest diagnosis? Like, do you, um, what is the the situation? Um, it's hard to say. I mean, they're kind of of all over the place. Um, you know, I think I think my my mother accepts it and is upset about it. Of course, my father I think might be in more in a state of denial. But he's coming around to accept it. Um, 
you know, how, how, how do you accept the fact that you're going to outlive a child? I mean, it's, yeah, you know, you're a parent and, you know, happen. right. You know, how, how do you, how do you, how, when you get news like that, how do you, how do you process it? Um, so it's, it's hard. Um, it's hard on them, obviously. And how, um, how are you processing it? I mean, more, and I, and I guess part of, you know, what we want to talk about is, you know, in a, in a way it's a, it's a test and a, and a blessing, I guess, um, to know in a sense that, okay, you know, your life expect, expectancy is shorter than it's known. It's not unknown or, you know, God forbid, I, of course, we always would pray for a miracle, but I, I know from our conversations that um, you've, you've gone in remission, you've come out, you've tried a lot of different experimental treatments and now, um, with your liver failing, your your oncologist and other doctors are not not hopeful that you have much more time, right? Correct. So, um, you know, like one of the things that reminds me, you know, we've been doing um, uh, these Project of Lumen classes where we've been doing deep dives into each chapter of the Quran with Professor Abel Fuddle. And it reminds me of this one, um, one chapter that we covered, I actually don't remember because we've been going through them so quickly. We've, we're now on our 74th chapter, but there was one time where he was explaining that um, you know, most people don't like to think about death, obviously, and a lot of times they don't um, factor that into the de the decisions they make in life. But part of it is it's an issue of time. Like if if someone held a gun to your head and said, "Okay, make your decision," and based on that decision, you know, presumably that that trigger would be pulled, and you would know, like, "Okay, I'm about to meet God." That that might actually affect you know the quality of this the decisions that you make so it's really that people are not um they're, they're not looking at death before them although the truth is all of us will die and none of us especially you know in the age of pandemic none of us know when our last day will be so if we we're wise we would choose wisely in everything we do not just put it off right like putting off a test or studying for a test right but, um but it's a bit of a gift um when you do know um with the you know and and I'm sure that that's had a tremendous effect on, on the decisions you've made and how you've chosen to, to spend, you know, even the time from, from the first email response that you got from Dr. Apple Fuddle. So I'm just curious if you had anything you want to share in that regard or, you know, how, how it effect, has affected your life. I mean, especially as a Muslim, you know, like maybe we should start with, you know, for people who are not familiar, if they're watching this and they're not f familiar with the Islamic view of sort of life and death, um, you know, we, we understand that that life is, is you know, temporal world, that there is something to come after and that what comes after is, is dependent on how you live this life. This life is, is a test and to see, you know, what um, right. decisions you make, how moral and ethical you are, how you, you know, it's, it's an interesting question because <clears throat> um, in part because um, kind of like I was saying before, I've had some very, very vivid and I can go into details if you want, but I can, I've had some very um, vivid dreams um, regarding, you know, the afterlife and, you know, decisions made for better or worse um, in this life. Um, Yeah. Uh, sorry, it's a hard question to answer. Okay. Um, I I I, uh, um, I I ask hard questions, and I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, no. It's, it, you like, should be asking it? hard questions. <laughs> um, you should be a absolutely asking hard questions. I just have to, like I said, you know, think about it for a second. Of course, take um, your time. <laughs> you, know. you, so, you don't have to answer for me, just in your back pocket. <laughs> yeah. Right. So I mean, you know, it, it's it's kind of like you know, you once asked me. Um, if I was afraid to die, and I, I kind of demurred and said, you know, if because I've had dreams where I've died, where I've had, where I've literally had the angel of death, kind of pull pull my soul out of my body. Oh my god! Um, it the answer to that question is no. The that I'm not afraid because it was euphoric. It was it was like um the greatest narcotic you've ever had <laughs> um, I mean seriously it was I've been on a number of narcotics at the hospital and and at home and stuff like that 
And I can tell you right now that there is a uh, no narcotic that is equivalent, at least in my opinion, for the experience of having one soul taken out of their body, at least if they've been just. And hopefully that, that means I've been just, um, sure. you know, so um, that's that, you know, you still have to, pay, you still have to face judgment. Everyone faces judgment. Um, but, you know, you it, about um, the continuation of that dream too, about the part about facing judgment. Yes, you have, you have to face, you have to face judgment, unfortunately, and you still have to, um, what's the right word? Um, fa face up to your sins, so to speak. You have to see, even if you're forgiven your sins, you still have to see what it is you're forgiven from, so to speak. And interestingly, you and I were talking about how um, one of the chapters, the second chapter that we covered in the Project Illumin series that we're doing at Usuli was Surah al Jafia, <clears throat> which was exactly the point about, um, you know, in, in the Islamic tradition, it, we talk about how on the final day, your, your body parts will testify against you, you know, so whether right. it's you know, your, your hands will testify as to what you made your hands do or your feet might testify as to where your feet had to take you, whether you were committing sin somewhere or, you know, if you were not taking care of your body and, and filling it with, you know, too much sugar or whatever. Um, yeah, sure. So it's kind of like everything, right? But in, in Surah al Jafia, what was really um, tremendous was um, the learning that it's like you will see before your eyes, almost like a recording of your life and everything that you did and the sins that you committed and the good that you committed. Um, and you were explaining to me that that was very similar to what you experienced in your dream, right? Yeah, that's, that is correct. And that was yeah. incredible. It wasn't, it wasn't a film. It was to me, like I said, it was more like a museum, but same thing, you know, wow. your, your actions get put on display wow. and you have to face them. Do you remember how you felt when you were in that situation? Um, this, did this, this felt like fortunate in the sense that for, fortunate in the sense that because um, there were there were angels present, and even though I was having to pass through that particular portion of hell, so to speak, and in and see my own um, misdeeds, as it were, um, there were angels there who were assuring me that. Um, my, my time there was only brief, um, that I would only bear witness to, excuse me, what I had done as opposed to staying there. There were, for lack of a better word, prison cells who were there, that were there to uh, house people who were not so lucky, so to speak, who... Wow who were not meant to move on from that state. So um, in that sense, you know, I felt myself kind of lucky to, to, to um, have it, have being able to move on. How did you feel? Like, did that feel like a dream or did it feel very real to you? It felt very real. And how long ago was that? Do you remember? Oh, how long ago was that? Maybe nine months ago. Oh, wow. And how, like, when you woke up from that, how did, how did you, how did that make you react or how, how did you feel about that? Um, scared. <laughs> uh, um, scared, I guess, is the, is, is the one word that would come to mind. But again, it was, it was the totality of the dream that needs to be taken into account. So yeah. again, it was the, the, uh, being taken out of my body that was also euphoric you know and, and like I said is not something I would worry about um if that's if if that's a realistic representation of what death is like you know the moment that you leave your body then I'm I'm not worried just because inshallah inshallah and yeah we, we learned and through again the the classes on the Quran that for people who have lived a good life um, that you, you know, upon death get greeted by angels that, you know, are happy to see you and are light. Um, 
as opposed to what happens if you have not lived a good life and that it's extremely scary and like you would be greeted by you know angels that are dark and angry and scary correct um so that is um tremendous alhamdulillah inshallah that that is that is something you know to calm fear and yeah definitely do you feel like that affected your your you know either how you what you did in that you know since then since or um your just general feeling about um where you are now in your condition actually surprisingly not only because it didn't really change anything in terms of what I thought I already understood or knew. Yeah. You know, it didn't, it didn't, it didn't add or change my knowledge per, per se. Um, it just kind of, you know, it was just, it was kind of just like, you know, you know, flavoring on a pizza, if you will. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> It, it it was it was something that added to to the flavor of of the experience but you know i wouldn't i wouldn't say was was by itself earth moving either you know so um so yeah. i mentioned to you that i'd ask you this question um oftentimes you know in our in our classes and our work at asuli we um we teach people that you know first of all obviously everything begins and ends with your relationship with god and we really encourage people um you know to to focus on that intimate relationship with god um and that that every person has you know like a gift and a purpose something special that god gave them or that they're supposed to do and i um you know, I wonder if reflecting, you know, on, on, on your life, which, I mean, obviously it's, um, you know, we, we don't choose our fate and, and certainly you're, you're very young and, you know, I know you haven't, as, as far as I know, you don't, you haven't gotten married, you don't have kids, you know, um, no. and we've talked a lot about how you wanted a dog <laughs> and I wish yeah. I could help <laughs> grant you that wish. Um, yeah. but, you know, so I'm wondering if, if, you know, what you think you know your gift or purpose um was if you feel like you know you you were able to accomplish that or if um you know i mean i guess any any thoughts that and you're in a very special place right you you, you have yeah. now an, an opportunity to look back on your life and think about okay um what's the legacy that i want to leave behind um and all of us you know also as we've learned in Project Illumin is that it's not just about how how we lived our lives, but about the legacy we leave behind because that will continue, you know, either sure. for better or worse after we're gone. Yeah, and and Professor Alfadel, for his part, you know, he frequently mentions how important it is, you know, that Muslims give from their wealth to you know various causes, and you know, I think he gets, I don't know, if frustrated is the right word but he, he gets um, adamant that, um, that, that the Muslim community does a better job of taking care of itself. Mm -hmm. So in, in that sense, you know, um, should I have donated more money, for example, to, you know, throughout my life, maybe, I mean, you, you, you know how much money I've donated. Um, it's not, it's not big money. It's not, I'm not I'm not wealthy so I'm not no I'm not donating millions of dollars but um have I lived a fulfilling life that's I hope so <laughs> <laughs> I or sure I, hope so I guess um, you know these are really difficult things but it's like um you know, like if I, if I, for example, think about, okay, well, what was my purpose? And, you know, um, I, I always felt, you know, that it became very apparent after, you know, I, I converted and then I um, spent a year kind of engrossed in mainstream Muslim experience, which was very right. not uninspired. You know, if you go to the mosque and you come across, you know, just the cultural dynamics and the level of education um, you know, in a largely immigrant community, it's a very, very different experience than you expect when you come to Islam through, 
you know, intellectual means through reading books, um, sure. through like prayer and, and so, which was much more of my experience. Like I didn't meet Muslims until after, I mean, I met Muslims, not many, but I, I never went to a mosque until after I converted. And then the experience that I had in the year after that was really jarring and, and um, surprising um, and not sure. in a great way. But, um, and then I met Dr. Abel Fuddle, my husband, um, and then that began this journey of learning um, and growing um, and, and being exposed to this methodology, which now I'm so passionate about and which is what we teach at Asuli. So I've always felt like my purpose was very much connected to trying to um, share what God had exposed me to um, and, and paying back like all of the blessings that I've had through educa you know, educating others and trying to leave a legacy of Dr. Abel Fuddle's thought. So, um, it's clearer to me, like, okay, I believe that's my purpose because there's so many random things that happened in my life that were just, you know, it's only by God's design. It's definitely right. not by, by anything I did. So, um, you know, I don't know. And, if and in order to answer the question too, you have to drag in, um, you know, all, all aspects of one's life, including one's professional life. So, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm under a NDA that prevents me from well, talking course, about what sorry. I do, but, um, you know, if it weren't for that NDA, would I tell you that I had a fulfilling career? I would say yes. You know, um, so okay. Uh, even so, even even as you know, something something as simple as keeping the computers running, you know, can can be fulfilling. And you um, the, kept the world turning peacefully. Yeah. <laughs> running yeah yeah basically prevented a lot of like hacking attacks or things like that well we this is good this is left to our imagination that you've done heroic amazing things that we will never know but you probably saved the world several times over so for that we're grateful yeah, <laughs> that was I, your, yeah I don't know about saving it was the your gift <laughs> just, you know, yeah keeping just just again my, I'm, I'm proud of my professional life I'm, I'm you know full, fulfilled there so um uh, in terms of, you know, purpose, yeah, I don't, I don't have a wife or kids, but, um, you know, it, that too is, is, you know, you don't have to have a wife or kids to have a fulfilling no. life. No, and ultimately it's about your, your relationship with God, and, you know, I mean, clearly it seems that, um, I mean, I want to ask you about, like, how, how Islam or your relationship with God or the Quran or anything that you think um, was particularly instrumental or, or comforting to you as you were, you know, dealing with health issues. Um, you know, did you find that this, you know, we always learn that when, when God gives you some kind of challenge or, or difficult test, it's actually a way to draw closer to God. I mean, I don't know if you have sure. any advice that you might want to offer or share. Um, well, I mean, there, there are, you know, favorite hadith and Quranic lines that I'm, I'm a fan of. You know, my, I think, I think my favorite is, you know, the one that says, <clears throat> let me make sure I don't butcher this too badly, but um, it was something along the lines of, um, uh, I am as my servant expects to find me. Let him think of me as he will. When he draws to me by the length of a hand, I draw him by the length of a fathom. When he walks towards me, I, I rush towards him. When he mentions to me to a, 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 an assembly, I mention him to an assembly greater than it. Um, you know, and I, I think that's, that's very, very powerful. And, you know, the, the, I think at one point, Professor too mentioned that, you know, when you say Allahu Akbar, you know, you're, you know, you get God's attention, mm -hmm. um, and the, the notion that you can get God's attention just by saying "Allahu Akbar" um, is is, I think, profound telling. Um, there is another line from the Quran that that um, you know kind of serves as some in, some level of inspiration, which is that it points out somewhere along the lines it says something like. Um, uh, what does it say? Um, I, I, did you did you think that you could go to heaven without suffering first? No, even the prophets of old would um, cry sometimes cry out, "Where is the help of God?" 
surely the help of God is always near. Yeah. And, you know, when I'm in, you know, a state of agony, when I'm, you know, I'm trying to manage my pain with painkillers and stuff, um, that, that one line of um, surely the help of God is always near is something that, I don't know if it's an actual, I forget what the, I forget what the term is when you, um, you recite a single line over and over again. Vicar? Um, yes. Like remembrance of God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that's an, a, an, a, an official dicker. Um, but I mean, a dicker is, is, you know, when, whenever you remember God and you, if you say it, it, it over and over, it's just this remembrance of God. I don't know if it, official, I'm not sure what you mean, but it's like if somebody like wrote it and says, hey, this, yeah, is something for you, or if you just remember. Um, on yeah. So the, 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 but the bottom line is that is that I, I, that's the one, that's probably the one that I recite most when I'm in a phys state of um, physical discomfort, shall we say. Yeah. Well, we know, we know that, you know, in our tradition that God is with those who, who are ill, right. And, and mm -hmm. who are disempowered and um, that there's, um, so, you know, I mean, God obviously knows everything that you're experiencing and everything you're, you're suffering and, um, you're definitely, you know, you're obviously not alone. So, um, like reflecting on, you know, your your life. Is there anything that you, um, I don't know. I guess wish you had done or could have done differently, or um, you know, even like advice for converts, people who are seeking seeking religion, or you know, just. Um, I mean, it's like, yeah. you know, it's a very different experience when you live with illness. It's a constant reminder. And sure. like I know I've seen Dr. Bofadol, you know, he's gone through so many health challenges and, and it's a constant reminder in a way it's a little bit of a blessing because it's front and center, right? That, right. I, I would say one, one of the things, you know, that one of, one of my favorite things, even though it came from a Christian, um, Voltaire, um said you know don't let the perfect be the enemy of the very good and you know that that to me rings true for i think a lot of um muslim converts yes. is that they 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 think they join up and then they think that they need to live a perfect life a perfect muslim life um in order to gain god's salvation and that's false you know, you don't, you don't need to live a perfect life. Um, you know, so, um, that's, that's just something to, to be aware of, I think. Um, I think one of the things that really has, has struck me, you know, over the years that we've known each other and that you always write, you always drop these amazing quotes or things. <laughs> it's like, you obviously read a lot, which is great because the vast majority of Muslims now don't really read. Right. Um, and I know you always encourage Dr. Wolfettle to share names of books so you'll you'll get them and read them, um, which, you know, I think this is where I think converts really, um, you know, they they get they they have a lot of knowledge because they spend a lot of time and they like reading. And I mean, I, it's hard. Of course, you don't want to generalize. I'm sure not every convert does that, but it's almost like by definition to arrive at deciding you want to be Muslim requires that you have to do a lot of work to overcome um, a lot of negative baggage, you know, and um, True. It comes with knowledge and comes with reading. And um, so it's, you know, like, this is why I've always said, I believe that converts are, are the future of the world because they, they, they come with passion, they come with zeal, and they come also with that sense of like perfectionism a lot of times, right? They want to do things right and well um if they're going to do it they're going to like i know for me it's like okay i'm going to do this i'm going to do this you know go all in <laughs> right absolutely um, you know like and sorry go ahead no 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 that's it I mean, if you wanted to comment on yeah no uh and i yeah i would i, I would say that unfortunately you know the one of the prof the themes the professor touches on frequently um rightfully so is you know the the um islamophobic industry um and you know how it's an actual industry 
to you know generate money and profit just profit margins and revenues and everything else like that yeah. um to to generate hatred for muslims and um you know it's unfortunate uh not just no unfortunate is is too weak a word it's it's a travesty i think to um unfortunately um let that happen and um as much as i like converts unfortunately i think they're also vulnerable mm -hmm. to that that sort of thing so one, one of the things i used to tell um muslim friends you know when i was talking about the professor's work is that you know one one of the things that faces faced um uh converts was the the specter of um wahhabism mm -hmm. we, we don't talk about wahhabism nearly as much as we used to um it's kind of but it's still there now. <laughs> unfortunately i mean what i remember i'm sorry i didn't mean to cut you off but yeah, yeah. wahhabism is um you know before the current crown prince took over was really like what was driving this very conservative strain, all the stuff that you hear in the news that's really ugly, right? And that um, infected our, our, our mosques, you know, all the stuff about oh, women, you know, have to separate women from men and you have to, you know, cover women and, and um, you know, all the stuff that you look at and you just cringe because you feel like this is, this is morally ugly. But a lot of that <clears throat> flipped, a, flipped a switch and changed overnight when M MBS, you know, Mohammed bin Salman became the new crown prince. And now it's okay to have halal bars in Saudi Arabia. It's okay to, <laughs> you know, have music and dancing and, you know, babus or, or I see what you say, uh, like, you know, scant scantily clad women, um, you know, performing in concerts in Saudi Arabia. So, but right. the, the legacy of, of Wahhabism lives on. Anyway, forgive my my uh, interjection. Go ahead. No, 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 not, not at all. I, and and that I would I would say that you know the you know Wahhabism is is you know more or less on on the wane, but when it was kind of a, a real problem for for converts because converts would join up and then they would get exposed to Wahhabism and same thing they wanted to be good Muslims so they you know would um, listen to Wahhabi Wahhabis and you know start doing crazy doing or saying or following crazy beliefs um you know that that was not good um i i, I would say that to my muslim friends that professor al-fadl's work was to um what did i say professor al-fadl's work was to wahhabism what polio vaccine was to polio you know, <laughs> you know seriously i mean it's it, it, you know wahhabism was a disease of the mind yeah yeah <laughs> you know it it was it would rot the brain right much much like polio did um and you know so um again we don't have that particular problem anymore but we do have new problems we have new versions of quote unquote polio Absolutely. And I would say that the 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 uh, analogy still stands. Yes. You know that Professor Fadel's work still st stands as a sort of vaccine against, say, smallpox of the mind. You know. <laughs> um, is is this how you found yourself immunizing yourself over the years um, from all the crazy stuff that you would see in the world? And yeah, actually. I mean, I, I, I would, I would <laughs> seriously, that's, that's why um, I, I don't know if you remember, but one of the things that I, I mentioned early in my emails um, was the notion that, you know, I hadn't met any Wahhabis in the wild and, and that I was kind of curious to actually, actually like meet some. You were hoping I was, to find some so you could start engaging them. <laughs> yeah, just because I wanted to be I, I wanted i wanted to understand it you know and understand how you could you could believe that the the crayon could say or imply the things that you think that it implies yeah so did you yeah. have you did you ever have a chance to engage any wahhabis or have that wish fulfilled not not really not as far as i know if they if they did they didn't announce themselves but so maybe in God fairness they also on God had mercy on those potential people you could have met. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> um, and in fairness, you know, also they, the Wahhabis don't call themselves Wahhabis, right? They tend to call themselves Salafis, I believe. So, oh, yes. you know, and, yeah. and stuff like that. The more, the more telling um, um, indicator is uh, whether or not they support MBS, MBC, Assad, CC, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Because those guys are punks. And, um, you know, to support them really requires a real stretch of one's moral compass. Yeah. Um, so, so you always struck me as someone who, like, if you had the health that you would start some revolutions or some wars and battles. <laughs> Um, and maybe this is God's mercy on all of us that, okay, no, we're, you know, <laughs> like, but um, no, I, war, war, not, war and violence are obsolete. I mean, I would say that too, is, is that, um, you know, wh wh you know, people don't get me wrong. I I'm sympathetic to people who want to protest in the mid East against people like Assad and CC and stuff like that. Um, but, um, Taking to the streets should always be a last resort, in my opinion. Um, all other options should be exhausted first. And even, even with regards to things like um, uh, US foreign policy and um, uh, whatchamacallit, uh, Syria, for example, people, had, there, were, there was a time when people were calling for US intervention there. And there wasn't so much a matter of could, the US probably could, have stopped a lot of the massacres. The, the question was a matter of should, and should should the U.S. get embroiled into another Mid East war? You know, and um, uh, I think there's there's reasonable people can disagree. Uh, I, will, I will leave it at that. Re reasonable people can disagree about whether or not the U.S. should have gotten involved more in Syria or not. Yeah. Well, I mean, now with especially, I mean, there's so many wars everywhere, um, especially, you know, uh, where Muslims are suffering. And, you know, now with Ukraine, it's, it's almost right. like, you know, adding insult to injury that it was within all of you Western folks to rise to the occasion and do what needs to be done, you know, whether it's, you know, shutting off, um, you know, financial flows or um, sending, you know, you're volunteering to go fight and, you know, all these things that, that could have been done that were said were not, not allowed to be done for, for Middle Eastern refugees and people you know, suffering. Right. But I digress. <laughs> so it's a hard right, time right. to get into all of that. But um, so do you have any, um, any last, I guess, advice for you know any wars not you know obviously not wars but um battles uh per se um that you hope you know that you might have taken on and that you hope maybe others would be inspired to take on with what you know everything you know o only the the ones that kind of the ones i mentioned in terms of things like um uh, you know, donating more. I mean, the professor is absolutely correct when he talks about how stingy the Muslim community can be with regards to our own religion. I mean, I, at one point, I, I think I, I told you, you know, you, you know that I donated a $10,000 check to you guys. Um, and, and the reasons for that are, are I, I can get into or not, but the point is that I, I told that to a Muslim friend who he didn't, he didn't really scoff at it per se, but he, he was kind of, he kind of gave me this look like, why, why did you do that? Yeah. yeah. Why, why, why would you give $10,000 to, you know, this, this scholar who all he does is get up every Friday and complain about how, how bad things are and, you know, and, and he does these halakas, which, you know, aren't very fancy and, <laughs> and, you know, uh, what, what's, what's the point? And, um, 
and maybe and I, I'm not a mind reader. Maybe he was he I misread, misread him, but that's sort of the impression I got off of him. And um, you know, it's it's a uh, unfortunate because we do need to take care of ourselves. I mean, we do need to, as a community, need to do a better job of watching out for ourselves. And as part of that, one of my favorite Quranic lines is, you know, the God will not change the circumstances of the people until the people first change the circumstances of themselves. Okay. So, you know, it, it, it in, the, in the case of um, Islam, you know, we can't, we can't expect God to change things. And so, and, you know, it's, it's, as an example too, you know, like one of the things that I thought was prescient was, and, you know, this is, we can, we, 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 we might disagree on this part, portion, but one of, one of the things that I thought was important after um, World War II, for example, was the Arab Spring and um, the Arab Spring was important because it represented the first time that the people of the Mideast weren't blaming America and Israel for their problems. Mm. And um, yes, American and Israel, they have their problems. They interfere with foreign policy and do all sorts of you know, nonsense and nastiness. And yes, we should condemn that and all that other stuff. But at the same time, you need to take some personal responsibility and say to yourselves, okay, but what can we change? Yes, America and Israel are doing bad things and have crappy foreign policy, but what, what, what can we do that will make things better? And I thought that's what, what happened in Tunisia, for example, which is that, which is that Tunisians largely took, you know, took responsibility themselves Right. Same thing with Egypt, even in, in Syria, which is that they, they kind of like stopped, looked around and said, you know, um, we're, 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 we're beating up on our, ourselves, we're beating up on each other, but why? We should be beating up on our leaders. And they're right. I mean, I think that, you know, in the case of Assad or CC or N MBS or MBC or any of these, these others, um, you know, don't don't get distracted by those factors when you know you can do things yourself and stuff like that. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, we we actually we didn't have a chance to talk yet about um, your experience actually with the American Muslim community so much because I know you went and tried and attend like some of these new Muslim groups and things like that. I mean, it sort of yes, into what you said with your your friend because it feels like. Muslims are not in an active mindset of, of change and um, you know taking responsibility for the way things things are. Um, I don't know if you wanted to share anything about like your impressions as a new Muslim. I mean, we you know we all have our own stories about being a new Muslim and um, you know. So I guess my question is. Um, do you want to talk about any of the, the experiences that you shared, any like advice that you might have for other people that are navigating that? Only that um, the people who are teaching those courses, you have to kind of do your own research as to whether or not they know what they're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, uh, the, for better or worse, the people teaching it, you know, at one point, I showed up for one and they were handing out books about Muhammad, a historical book about Muhammad. And, and, that, and that's all fine and good and everything. Don't, don't get me wrong. That's, that's good to understand the historical context of Muhammad. But at one point they asked the question, okay, well, what do you, what do you know about Muhammad? And there was crickets. And <laughs> you know, it, was, it was a new class. So one might say that they didn't, weren't expected to know a whole lot but the teachers were. And so I, you know, kind of went and fell back on, you know, some of the, some of the stuff that I knew from professors um, lectures, which was, well, you know, he was, he was probably first and foremost, a family man, you know, you know, he took care of his, he took care of his family. 
um, more than anything else. And um, instead of saying like, oh yeah, that's, that's a good point. There, the point that seemed to be made was, yeah, yeah, that's nice. Next point. <laughs> so. Right. Okay, well, let's, let me, let me just close with this last question. Um, sure. How, if, you know, if, if someone asks you, how, how would you like to be remembered? How, how would I like to be remembered? Yeah. That's a. The legacy that you left behind or anything like, you know, who, who would stand? That is a <laughs> tough question that I did not put any thought into. Um, if you don't want to answer now, we can do it again another time, but, but give it a shot. <laughs> um, you know hopefully hopefully that I had you know a, I'm remembered for being honest hopefully remembered for being passionate about doing what is just and being just um, hopefully have a reputation for speaking the truth um those 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 sorts of things i guess i, I guess i would want to be remembered for well that that's always been my experience with you and that those are among the most important you know teachings that we've been learning obviously as we've been studying the quran is standing up for truth and justice and and all of that so you know may may allah reward you and elevate you for all of your best deeds and um you know inshallah i i pray that that the dream that you had is is you know that is absolutely right i mean what what, what i've shared with you before you know about what Sheikh said um is that it's it's probably a sign not a dream and um, sure. a message not a sign a message excuse me um and you know, may um, may you not have to experience much, much suffering, but for all the suffering you do, may Allah, you know, return um, grant you just exponentially more, inshallah. And um, you know, thank you for taking this this time. I know it's it's a struggle, especially you know now you're you're not feeling well, and and so I really really appreciate your your time, your honesty, and your insights. And you know, may may people um, really benefit from from you know what whatever they were able to to learn, and and may it touch their hearts. So thank you so much. And I'm going to close the session now. We can always okay. if you feel like there's more that you would like to add. This is you know an open open conversation. Only only, only likewise. Only only that. Thank you for you know putting these sorts of things together and the discussions and and the halakas and all the logistical stuff that needs to take place in order for the professor to, you know, do his thing. Um, you know, thank you for doing that. And may, may God reward you for that. Inshallah, it's my, my honor and blessing. Honestly, it's, it's, it's a gift to me to be able to, to do all of that. And um, so thank you everyone for, for joining us. Um, inshallah, please um, keep us and Cameron in your prayers. And, um, you know, I, I, Inshallah, we will all hopefully be together and reunited again one day um, in, in a much better place. Um, may we all have um, the, the beautiful experiences that Cameron, you know, experienced. Um, and Inshallah, um, you know, may those of us who care about Islam and, and knowledge and God and living, you know, good life um, be, be rewarded and be brought together in a much better place. So thank you so much. and. Um, Everybody have a wonderful week and we'll see you soon, inshallah. Thanks, Grace.